All right, so we've been waiting for Apple to do this for a long time. So they now have training feedback with watchOS 11 with their new effort rating feature for workouts, as well as their new training load feature for tracking long-term training trends. But along with that, they've also introduced their new Vitals app that tracks metrics on the recovery side of things. And this video, we're gonna talk about what these features are all about and how you can actually use them. Apple watches are generally known as being some of the best smartwatches around, but on the training side of things, although they do do a good job at tracking individual workouts, that's kind of where it ended. Like sure, I burned X amount of calories during this workout and maybe I also closed my rings, but how did that workout feel or what was the intensity? And then our broader level, am I putting in more work this week than maybe the last four weeks? Well, those are some of the questions that Apple's new effort rating and training load feature are trying to help us figure out. Now, I'm actually gonna be looking at these features from a few different lenses. So the first of which are my thoughts as a longtime endurance athlete, where I've been tracking my training as long as I can remember with all the traditional tools and metrics that are available. But I also wanna look at this through the lens of someone who may not have any prior knowledge of how training load is traditionally calculated. So basically, if you've been tracking your training load and performance related data for quite some time, how does this actually compare? And on the other hand, if you're newer to tracking longer term training trends, how can you actually use Apple's new features? Okay, so to start things out, let's talk about effort rating. So you can think of effort rating as the intensity or amount of exertion of a particular workout. And an effort rating should be automatically given for most cardio-based workouts. And the effort rating isn't just about heart rate. It's supposed to determine the effort rating based on your age, height, weight, and then factors in workout data like heart rate, GPS data, as well as elevation. And the effort rating for a workout is on a one to 10 scale. So basically anywhere from easy, which is one to three, moderate, which is four to six, hard, which is seven, to eight and then all out, which is nine to 10. But the most interesting part about effort rating though is that you can actually adjust this based on your own perception of the workout. So if you thought a particular workout was harder or easier than what your Apple Watch thought it was, you can actually adjust that. Maybe you just weren't feeling your workout that day like you weren't rested well enough or something like that. Or maybe it was like extra humid or windy. Or maybe you crushed your workout and it felt easy but it gave you a higher effort rating than how you actually felt. Again, you can adjust all of that. And this part right here where you can actually adjust your effort rating is the most unique thing about Apple's implementation of these training features versus how other brands implement training load. And we'll get to that here in just one second. Now for the actual automatic calculation and how that actually aligned with my perceived exertion of my workouts, most of my workouts are at a moderate to high level of exertion and it generally reflected that with an effort rating of around like seven for most workouts. But funny enough, even for harder workouts, it still registered a seven a lot of the time. I did have a couple hard workouts where it did automatically say that I did have actually a hard workout, but there were also some workouts where it didn't give me an effort rating for some reason or another, even though they were one of their supported cardio-based workouts. And I wasn't really able to identify a pattern of why it would or would not give me an effort rating, but it's likely just a beta thing, but I'll certainly keep on testing that as time goes on. And one thing I did notice on a few occasions that it wouldn't show an effort rating when I completed the workout in the workout summary screen, but if I backed out of there and then went to the activity app and then scrolled down to see my workout details, the effort rating was actually there. Again, likely all just beta things. But again, what's nice here though is that we can just go ahead and go in and adjust this effort rating to how we actually felt, which then will translate into training load. Oh, and then and one last thing before we get into training load is that for workouts which don't automatically get an effort rating, so basically more non-cardio based workouts like weight training, you can go ahead and add an effort rating manually. Okay, so that's effort rating, but now let's talk about training load which takes your effort rating for workout and then also factors in time to calculate your training load. And how this individual workout data is used is to track your longer term training trends with their training load feature where you can pair the recent training over the last seven days to your longer term training trends over the last 28 days. So how this feature can actually be useful is let's say you want to ramp up your training load. Like let's say you're training for a marathon or something like that. You can use their training load feature to make sure that you're increasing your training load consistently over time. And then the same thing goes if let's say you're tapering for a race where you want to make sure that you're actually holding a bit back and tapering correctly leading up to your race. The concept of Apple's training load feature is very much the same as other companies who have similar features like Garmin, Chorus, and Training Peaks, amongst many others. And while the goal is the same in regards to tracking longer term training trends, the definition actually varies a little bit here. So the traditional use of the phrase training load is something that's quite specific that's calculated from pure data. Apple on the other hand is thinking about this differently where they not only want to use data like heart rate, but they also want to utilize your own perception of how hard a workout was to calculate training load. So this is going to be really interesting because your perceived exertion during workout can actually factor into your training load, which is different than what other platforms do. Does this strategy actually work though? 
I think it does, but it's not necessarily perfect either. So to give an example of where this concept works, let's talk about two completely different kinds of activities. So the first of which is a super hard interval session where I'm pegging my heart rate to its max for maybe like an hour, where my traditional training load from other platforms may give me a very high training load figure due to those high heart rate zones. But then let's talk about another kind of activity. Let's say a super long five hour hike or something like that, where my heart rate actually isn't all that high, which results in a low traditional training load figure, but at the end of the hike, I feel exactly the same as that short interval session, which has basically worked. So with those drastically different kinds of activities, with a traditional training load calculation based on purely heart rate, the training load numbers would actually be drastically different on other platforms, but my body may actually feel exactly the same, which is like completely spent. That's where Apple's interpretation of effort rating and training load are kind of interesting, which could account for those kinds of scenarios. Now, there's a few areas where this does get a little bit muddy for me though. So first off, you don't get an individual training load score for each workout. You have your effort rating, but that's really it when you look at your workout details. Then if you hop over to your training load graph, well, you notice that there's no actual hard number displayed here other than a percentage of if you're above, steady, or below the average of your 28-day training load trend. So if what Apple is using for training load is effort rating multiplied by duration, I'd actually just love to see the actual training load number displayed in the workout details of an individual workout. The other portion that's a little bit cloudy for me is with effort rating when it comes to adjusting it manually. So in my mind, when I think about the effort that I put out in a workout, duration is a huge factor in the amount of effort that I actually put out. So for the workouts that I did that were super long, I actually went in and adjusted my effort rating to be harder than what it automatically gave me, which was again, most of the time like a seven, likely because I was spending most of my time in like zone two or zone three. Where this gets muddy though, is that training load is taking effort rating and then multiplying it by duration. But if my perceived exertion of a workout is higher due to duration, how do I actually mentally factor that in knowing that training load is already using duration? Like, do I actually have to adjust my mindset when applying an effort rating to not account for the amount of time on a workout. I hope that all kind of makes sense, but it actually did take me a little bit of time to actually kind of wrap my head around that sort of confusion. So that's Apple's effort rating and training load features. So now let's talk about their new Vitals app. So the Vitals app tracks different metrics while you sleep, including your heart rate, respiratory rate, wrist temperature, blood oxygen saturation levels, as well as sleep duration. And the goal with the Vitals app is to give you a daily check-in to see if these metrics are within normal range. And then it can also alert you if any of these data points is out of range, which at that point could let you be aware that something may be off, whether that's the fact that you maybe had a super hard workout that day, so your heart rate could be elevated or maybe a higher respiration rate, or maybe you're sleeping at a higher elevation, which could result in a lower blood oxygen saturation level. And it takes about a week for the Apple Watch to get a baseline on all your metrics. And then after that point, it has a good gauge of where your body is actually at and can then identify any outliers that may come up. So for an example, after this night's sleep, all my measurements are typical where there's nothing out of range. So my heart rate was a little bit lower than usual during sleep, but still within range. My respiratory rate was slightly lower than usual, but again, within range. My wrist temperature was almost out of range that night. My blood oxygen saturation level was within range. And then my sleep duration was also longer than usual, but still normal. And then you'll not only be able to see your last night's sleep, but you'll also be able to see your ranges for the last seven days as well by just tapping on the upper left-hand corner up here, where you can then scroll through the individual metrics and see how those trended over the last seven days. And then finally at the bottom here, it also links back to a graph of your training load. Okay, so now let's talk about how you can actually use this information. So right now, the Vitals app is really giving you information on if your health metrics are normal or abnormal. So basically things are fine or maybe things are not so fine. So it can very well give you clues on if you should not train, like let's say there's an outlier on one of your metrics, but not necessarily like a, you're really primed for training, like you recovered really, really well last night, more just like, hey, everything's fine. And the Vitals app also isn't currently taking in HRV or heart rate variability within its metrics. Now, HRV is not the end all or be all when it comes to recovery metrics to track, but it can be an incredibly important metric that can correlate to how well your body has recovered. Again, at the moment, HRV isn't being factored in. And I think that's just one more piece of the puzzle, which can help bring all these features together into a true training and recovery tracking tools. So at the moment, as a recovery tool, it can definitely give you indications on maybe days that you shouldn't train, but it doesn't necessarily give you indications on like the best day to train. I really view a lot of these new features as building a foundation for a more cohesive training or 
recovery feature that I would guess is coming in the future at some point. It's not quite what you get from something like Garmin's training readiness feature, Whoop's strain recovery feature, as well as Aura's readiness feature, but I think it's the foundational elements that are needed for something more in the future. You can certainly compare the trends in your training load versus the information that's collected in vitals, but you kind of have to do a lot of manual analysis on your own here. However, I do like the fact that you can add your training load and vital status to the modular watch face in the Ultra, where you can use the bezel complications on the outside to show your vital status on the left and your training load on the right. But again, having some sort of direct tie-in and feedback between these two is what I'd really like to see. So on the training load side of things, I think it can be useful for sure. It's able to track your trends and training over a longer period of time, which is traditionally what training load is actually intended for, to make sure we're increasing, maintaining, or decreasing our training load depending on our needs. Effort rating also makes sense for the most part, but the cloudy part for me is again, when I go to adjust my effort rating to something higher based on the amount of effort that I thought it was for longer workouts, which is generally more. And again, I think something that would clear at least my confusion is if I could actually see an actual training load number for each workout, which would help me quantify how the effort rating directly translate to the training load number. Now, although I have been using traditional methods of tracking training load with heart rate data, I actually really like what Apple's doing here. And it mainly comes down to those extended activities at lower heart rate, where the load of my body was actually really hard just due to the longer duration, which could have actually equaled a much shorter workout and a much higher intensity. The only issue I think we really have is the use of the training load phrase, since that's a well-established term that's based on hard numbers, generally time spent in different heart rate zones. But this is definitely a great start for Apple rolling out these new features, and I do see these as being a foundation for something likely pretty cool later on down the road, which could be similar to features that are found on other platforms like Whoop, Garmin, and Aura. And I'll actually be doing some follow-up videos comparing Apple's new features to those other platforms, so make sure to subscribe to the channel to get a notification when those videos come out. Anyhow, definitely let us all know your thoughts on Apple's new training load and effort rating features down in the comment section down below. And if you found the information in this video useful, do me a favor and also hit that like button and also subscribe to the channel for plenty more sports tech videos that are coming soon. In the meantime, have fun out there and we will see you in the next video.